bilsin. E, i̇kinci konuşmamız emekli tüm genel, emekli bir gelçi doktor e, Şahit Haşmat. Pakistan'dan geliyor. 15 dakika. <gülüyor> Teşekkür ederim. Buyur. Kabin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kalu subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allam tana inna kantal alimul hakim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected chair, uh, Dr. Bullard. First of all, uh, I would like to extend my very sincere uh, gratitude to the organizers, organizers of this very important uh, Congress, Assam. It's a matter of great pleasure and single honor for me to participate uh, in the Islamic uh, Union Congress, which is a very noble cause. And uh, it's all, it's a pleasure again uh, to listen to very learned and distinguished scholars, those who have contemplated on various aspects of the cooperation. In next uh, 15 minutes, I shall be very quickly talking about uh, the principles and uh, could I have uh, the the, the, the remote control? Yeah. On the establishment of uh, uh, center for the mili military, you know, standards in the Islamic world. You just have to press this one to press the next one. Okay. Uh, as you all know, the cooperation and the collaboration uh, at the international and the regional level is essentially falls in the domain of the of foreign policy and foreign relations. So whenever we are talking of a defense collaboration, we must keep in mind that it will always be guided by the foreign policy and the foreign relations amongst the Muslim countries. Uh, all countries in the world, they take their decisions regarding their foreign policies and the foreign relations depending upon their own national interest. So when you are talking of a cooperation among the Muslim world, that means there has to be a commonality and convergence of the national interest. Whenever there is a non-commonality and there are divergent interests, the cooperation will be very difficult. The impact and the consequences of the cooperation, if we can achieve that, that will be in the diplomatic arena, in the economic domain, commerce and trade, defense and security, including the defense production. The defense production cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be in the comprehensive concept of the defense and security. The cooperation is directly contingent upon the commitment of the political leadership and the, uh, the cooperation extended by the countries. End result is dependent on the economic strength, technological development, convergence of interest, as I already mentioned, common perception, vision, and objectives. I was pleased to listen to Mr. Asim in the last uh, session, who very elaborately explained the concept of the joint defense and the concept of the joint command. I won't have the time to get into those uh, uh, intricacies. Coming on to the procedures, I think it's gone a little fast. Yeah. The principles and the procedures. It's a desirable objective, but we must keep in mind that unfortunately today the Islamic Union does not exist. So these are two parallel concepts which are going on. First you got to have the Islamic Union and then you can have different centers of excellence or different centers of the cooperation built on that. The other parallel approach is that you can keep thinking of all these things to be done. It's like a reverse or inverse pyramid. So you can continue with this and when you establish the Islamic Union you can establish these centers. Are some country 
a particular country or some countries can take the initiative and establish the center and when the Islamic Union is established then it can be merged into that. So that's something very important like an egg and chicken and that must be kept in mind. However, there's a great potential that does exist in the Muslim world for the cooperation on the economic and the defense cooperation. The political aspiration has been expressed a number of times repeatedly, but unfortunately it has never been put into action. The OIC Charter, number of speakers have already spoken about that. Unfortunately, the OIC Charter, there are serious conceptual and uh, organizational deficiencies into that. So if you want to do it within the OIC, you will have to amend the Charter, or it will have to be thought over as a stand-alone uh, concept. Anyhow, uh, the restructuring and reformation, reforming in the OIC is a better choice. The purpose, there has to be a purpose of every activity, so there has to be a purpose of establishing this center. The joint military centers per se have no purpose. They are actually uh, intended for political, economic and strategic objective. So first we have to define the guiding, the, the, the primary force and that force is always political, economic and of course the strategic at the level. However, what is the guiding factor? We have listened from a number of uh, uh, speakers, that's the Islamic unity and solidarity. The benefits which we can draw is the standardization, economization, maximization of the products. Instead of having 100 products, you can have 10 products. And those 10 standardized product, products, then you can multiply any number you want. There is an enhanced profitability, the cost effectiveness. 10 countries producing the tanks, 5 countries producing the aircrafts. So if you join them together, you are going to have a cost effective production. It will allow you interoperability in the multinational forces. We do not have a multinational forces, we do not have an Islamic force like NATO or some other countries. However, in the future that has to be integrated into it. The joint uh, military standards, they are adopted by the military forces which have common threat. There has to be a threat perception. If Turkey has a separate threat perception, Pakistan has a separate threat perception, Saudi so Arabia has a separate threat perception, Iran has a threat, separate threat perception, Malaysia and Indonesia has a th separate threat perception, you will never come on a joint understanding or a joint production or a joint response. So there has to be a threat perception, then a joint response to combat the same threat in by the military operations. Joint forces, I will not explain, Mr. Asim has explained in greater detail that the joint forces can be within one country from the two or more departments and it can be from different countries as well. The best example I can give you is the NATO. Turkey happens to be part of that. That's a living example of a joint forces. Well, of course, Aswail Warsaw Pact was also uh, one of the examples, no more there. There can be a temporary alliance as well. Not a classic example, but what has been done by Saudi Arabia for a short-term objectives um, by, you know, getting uh, resources from different countries for limited objectives that could also be called the joint forces. The joint uh, defense standards, what are the requirements, what do they entail? You have to start from the recruitment to the training to the acquisition of weapons and equipment, adoption of jo joint doctrine. We are not talking of a joint doctrine, we are talking of a joint production. So, I mean, like an egg and chicken, as I said, you will have to decide what needs to be done first. There has to be operational strategies, planning, technical implementation of operations, communication equipment, procedure, and provisioning of the logistic uh, support. What's the challenge? As briefly I as mentioned, at present there are no joint forces. There is no joint threat perception. There is no joint response. So what for you require the you know, joint standards? What for you require the joint equipment? So that's a very, very important cardinal question. There has to be clarity on the motivation. Is the motivation 
you know, your operational capability or the motivation is political or the motivation is commercial. So you have to, you know, slightly be clear uh, on all those things. Is it essentially within the OIC structure or it is going to be a standalone or it is going to be a parallel structure or both going to converge or both going to have crisscross, you know, interest at the end of the day. So this all needs to be done. <clears throat> now, what we are talking today is essentially in a hypothetical proposition. There is something in the air. We are talking of a joint uh, center. Well, there can be a joint agreement by the prospective participating countries. Out of, say, 57 countries or 61 countries, at times they are counted, there may be five or seven countries. They can come together. And they can sit down and they can sort out that these are the areas, these are the industries, we want to have a joint production and we want to have a joint structure. There has to be willingness of a correct implementation of the standards, training of the defense production industry participant countries and consensus, which is the most important and the most difficult thing in the political arena. Uh, then of course is the need assessment, prospects, possibilities and uh, challenges. I'm running uh, short of time. Quickly, I'll just go over the challenges in uh, establishing the ability standards. It's an uphill task. Easy, easier said than done. There's a highly competitive defense industrial complex in the world. The US economy, the European economy, and economy of the Russia and many other countries, it is run on the industrial, so you are going to compete with them. So there has to be a proper appraisal and a proper evaluation of them. Then there are a lot of divergent interests in the Muslim world. Unfortunately, Muslims are fighting among themselves. So that uh, is another issue. There is a technological deficit. There are only few countries. If I want to name them, you can just count them. I mean, the Turkey, Pakistan, Malaysia and few other. In terms of high-tech defense production, there are only few countries those who can come forward. However, there is a need for the resources, for the research and development, which no one country can provide, and it has to come from the participating countries. The need assessment is very important. The Muslims have enormous human resource, material resource. Their role in the global world, unfortunately, is negligible, it's minimal. If they want to take over or play the important role according to the potential in the Muslim world. So they have to come to the Islamic unity and solidarity, to the joint forces, to the joint doctrine, to the joint concept, to the joint command. And then, of course, they can come to the joint uh, center for the production as well. <clears throat> I think I have another two, three minutes left. Two minutes. Uh, the prerequisites. I mean, you can quickly have a look if there is any question. I will be delighted to answer that. The principle, which is the most important thing, a clearly defined mission. There has to be a mission statement for the center. What do you want to do? What do you want to do at a strategic level? The center should contribute in the R&D activities of the center should not duplicate, should be financially self-sufficient and self-reliant and there should be periodic reviews and there should be gradual change. The procedure, I will leave my detailed paper with Assam. Uh, when they are printing, uh, the, I mean, the report, they can get into all these procedures which are there, the strategic planning, the short and mid-term, long-term plan, the funding, the steering committee. The most important thing is to constitute a steering committee. The Assam should constitute a steering committee which can take care of this. I'll skip the collaboration. I've given an uh, you know, organogram. This is the suggested organogram of the center. Assam can, you know, go through this. There has to be a CEO and a chairman. I'm proposing three vice chairmen, one taking care of the international collaboration, then the defense production and administrative and the financial aspects. Just asking, you know, one more minute from the chair. To conclude, the collaboration in the defense is always preceded by 
the political and diplomatic initiative. I'm sorry, I have repeated it, I think, 10 times. There has to be a clarity on the political and diplomatic side. Only then you can move on in the other areas. The OIC needs to be restructured. Under present structure arrangement, nothing is going to move. OIC is a very, very weak organization. There is a need to enhance the cooperation. The Center for the Joint Military will have to have a self-sufficient, sorry, self, uh, uh, be self-sufficient and self-reliant. The political aim, of course, will remain the Islamic unity and the principle of the comparative advantage should be kept in mind. The specific responsibility to different countries or to different think tanks that can be assigned by the Assam. Last but not the least, my recommendation is that a steering committee must be established where you can have the experts from five to seven countries. Those should be prospective participants of this center. And then they can bring in their expertise. They can prepare a detailed feasibility report. That feasibility report should be presented to the board of governors or the board of management of the Assam. If you keep waiting for the next year, for next, you can have a Congress and you can have a report, but center will never be there on the ground. So there has to be done something in the interim period. It must give the clarity on the strategic side, on the doctrinal side, on the operational side, on the technological side, on the financial side, and on the administrative side. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry I had to rush uh, through because of the shortage of the time. Uh, thank you very much, the Chair. If there is any question, I will be del delighted to answer that.